May Day. Welcome to another episode of Science Division Live. My name is Alyssa Carlson and I'm a program specialist at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And today I'm so excited to be joined by Dr. Michelle Coons of the museum. We are so excited that you have joined us and we are watching that chat for any questions or comments that you might have during this presentation. So keep those coming. Let us know where you're watching from in the world and who you're watching with and any questions you might have during the presentation. We're so excited that you're here. And again, happy May Day. All right, Dr. Coons, can you tell us what in the world you are going to be talking about today? Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, as Alyssa said, I'm Michelle Coons. I'm the Curator of Archaeology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I'm going to talk a bit about the Moche archaeological culture from Peru's north coast. Should I just go ahead and start sharing here? Yes, let's do it. All right. Okay. So you can see everything. I just want to make sure it's all it's all sharing. It all looks great. Great. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and get started here. So a lot of people have um, heard of the Inca, a very well known archaeology archaeological culture from um, South America, and people have heard of Machu Picchu. And so here on the map, you can see where Machu Picchu is located. The Inca, well, as we you know as we know about them were there for kind of a relatively short amount of time from the 1400s or so until the 1500s when the Spanish showed up. But we're gonna be going back in time even further to the um, time period around 250 AD to 900 AD and to the Northern coast of Peru in this shaded region that you see right here to talk about the Moche. And here is a map of that region a little bit closer up. And we understand the Moche to have lived in about 10, 12 of these contiguous um, desert coastal valleys. And so here's a map of what that, uh, a um, satellite image of what the coast looks like. And so you see these rivers cross cutting a very desert, desert plain. And then the, um, the valleys are irrigated by canal irrigation. And of course the Moche also were very reliant on the sea for both food and for transportation. But we recognize moche as an archaeological phenomenon by a suite of different objects and artifacts and features, including these really large um, pyramids, what we call locally wakas, waka centers, that are built out of adobe bricks. Many of these have um, murals, beautiful multicolor polychrome murals that are painted onto the facades. The Moche are known for their, their artwork, especially metallurgy, and very well known for their ceramics that are both in these figurative forms of animals, plants, people, and these fine line forms. And so here is an example of a fine line drawing on a ceramic vessel. And um, I'm gonna, this is a rollout drawing of that. So it's basically a two dimension, if we were looking at what was on that, on that bottle in two dimensions. And this particular style of bottle, I'll go back really quickly, is called a stirrup spout bottle. And so this scene, and we know this scene is on at least a hundred different vessels, but there's components of different of, of these figures that are seen on all kinds of moche vessels. Um, but what we're looking at here is on the bottom register, and I think I can get my mouse going here and you'll be able to see it. On the bottom register here, we see warriors and they're slitting the throats of prisoners and they're filling up these little goblets with the blood of these prisoners. And then the goblets are on the upper register here being presented to um, some of the more elite figures, so to speak, in the, in, um, in the in moche world and these people that are very very uh, highly dressed and regaled um and so for a long time we didn't know if these types of scenes were referring to myths or if they were real people in the moche world in south america there was not a writing system like we see in other in other ancient cultures and so we really have archaeology and art that we need to rely on to understand um some aspects of these cultures and so for a really long time, we didn't know as to whether or not these were, um, these were real people or what was going on. And then in 1987, 
looters were found um, to be looting uh, a, a tomb on the, in the site of Sipan, Sipan in this north coastal site here. Um, and what happened was all kinds of materials started to flood the black market, all kinds of gold and um, really fancy ceramics. And so the people were a little bit, you know, the authorities were like, what's going on? They called an archeologist, archeologist named Walter Alva to come see what was happening at the site. And what was discovered is the richest burial that's ever been found in the new world. Um, and what was really interesting about that is that this individual was buried with all of the regalia from figure A, from the sacrifice ceremony that we see on these, in these pictures. Um, and so there was this understanding that, oh, well, maybe these are people that are in Moche society. Well, the 1987 and the discovery of Sipan was a real watershed moment in our understanding of Formoche because prior to this time, very few excavations had been allowed at these Waka centers because a lot of the, um, it was thought that a lot of these um, materials were, were um, you know, that, that it would promote looting if people were to, if archaeologists were to come in and, and start excavating, or that the sites were already really looted, which is true, it looks like the surface of the moon, but it was realized that we better actually have some professional work done here, or we're not going to um, really understand this at all. So a whole host of new projects started out after 1987, including at the site of San Jose de Moro, where there have been to date, I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on the number, but I've, around 15 priestesses that have been found um, since, the, since the 90s. And what's been interesting about these priestesses is that they have been buried with a lot of the um, regalia and um, items that we see from figure, with figure C in the sacrifice ceremony. As you can see here, including a goblet where, um, which some tests have been done, and we know that human blood was in some of these in some of these goblets. So th they came to this realization that these were um, roles that people took on in their life, rather, and that it wasn't just like one individual, one king that we're seeing on these vessels, but they kind of like you know how you consider priests and cardinals in the in like the Catholic Church so that multiple people took on these roles. So again, this watershed moment in the 90s, a whole bunch of excavations started to occur, especially in this heartland ver um, area of the Moche. So in these Chicama and Moche valleys in this area right here, including at the sites of Huacas de Moche, which is one of the largest Moche site, and the site of El Brujo, which I'm going to talk about both of these in a second. So the site of El Brujo in the Chicama Valley, and this is an artistic rep, um, reproduction of what that what one of the wakas looks like here. Right here um, in 2005, right in this little patio area in front of these beautiful murals, the Senora de Cal was found. And this is um, a mummy bundle, and she was wrapped in many layers. And there's very few examples of mummies, and, and this is um, because of the preservation. And so this particular site, the preservation was really good, so textiles preserved. And so they, um, they unwrapped her because this was such a unique finding. And inside each of these layers, we find all kinds of um, headdresses and um, metal plaques that would have been on, on dresses. And they have a museum now for her that has all these necklaces and just tons of gold and really, really amazing, amazing materials that have been found here. And some people consider that she may have been figure D from the sacrifice ceremony, but we're not still not really 100% sure if this is if we can make that determination. All right, moving down to the Moche um, Valley uh, and to the, the site of Wakase Moche, which is the largest of the Moche sites and thought to be in some some people consider to be like the capital site where we have the Waka de la Luna and the Waka del Sol. The Waka del Sol at, at, um, at one time was the largest structure in all of the New World. The Spanish, when they came, they diverted the Moche River and two thirds of the structure is now gone. They were looking for gold. We don't know what they found, but it's a massive, massive structure. We're going to talk though about the Waka de la Luna. And since the 90s, all these beautiful murals have been discovered on the facade of, the, of, the, um, of this waka, including you can see here some prisoners, I mean some warriors who have the clothing of prisoners over their war clubs, and here's a line of prisoners. And we think that this waka was actually used for ceremonies, like the sacrifice ceremony. Um, up on the top part of the patio here, let me get my mouse going, right here, 
there a bunch of sacrificial victims have been found here that, of prisoners. And we believe that the prisoners were led up the ramp, people in the plaza, prisoners led up the ramp. And in this front part here, there would have been um, ceremonies you know, on this like the, this platform here called like a, a dais. Um, and you can see it's very similar to what we see in the artwork here where we have prisoners and the elite guy holding a goblet supposedly of blood um, up here on this, um, on this dais. So we think these types of ceremonies were performed. So really interesting, the art is helping us to understand the archeology span and the archeology span is really helping us to understand the art, but you can't just read the art. You have to have the archeology span to, to back it up because it's definitely, there's a lot of other crazy stuff going on in Moche art too. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've done in the Moche um, region and some of my, my particular interests. Um, prior, so back prior to the 90s, for a very long time, it was thought that the Moche um, was a homogenous state that really took up the entire, uh, all these coastal regions. At the heartland of the, of the Moche state was in this Chicama Moche Valley and through conquest, they went out and took over. Um, after these excavations in Sipan, after the excavations in the 90s, Sipan was found, we realized that there's really a northern region and a southern region, and they're quite different ceramics um, and architecture actually characterized these two regions. So different, different understanding of what that, what Moche really was. But even more recently, within the last, I would say, decade or so, we've become, we've come to realize that it was actually even more complex and that each valley what had an, a series of independent polities within that valley and the relationships between polities could cross cut valleys or it could be within the within a valley and it's just a much, much more complex um, political system that's emerging in recent years. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Chicama Valley, which is flashing here, um, which is the northernmost valley in the southern Moche realm and particularly the site of Lee Capados, where I did dis my dissertation research. Um, some years ago now. And so the site of Likapa Dose has two of these wakas and there's a canal that runs through the waka, like between the two wakas that separates the two halves of the site. On the waka A site, waka A side, there are a lot of ceramics um, that you can see like this, this style of ceramic, it's moche, but it's kind of plain. Lots of these goblets and the waka itself um, is kind of like a highly visible structure um, that looks a lot like the, what might, be, looks a little bit like structures like the Waka de la Luna. Waka, the other side of the, the canal is characterized by Waka B and these really fine line moche ceramics, what we really typically see as moche. And we think that lots of, um, there's a residential area here and we think that lots of feasting must have occurred in this region based on, in this um, area based off of the, the, the artifacts that we're finding. Um, and so Waka A, we, again here, I think was something similar to what the sacrifice ceremony that was going on in this part of the site. Different things happening in different sectors of the site that are um, separated by a irrig irrigation canal. So recently I've been looking at irrigation network in the, in the Chicama Valley and um, realizing that I think that there, we can look at political divisions in the Moche time period based off of how the irrigation system and the branches of the irrigation system divide the land. And we know in the late pre-Hispanic times, right at the time of contact that the irrigation system dictated political divisions. And I think we can actually trace this back to earlier time periods because we're finding different kinds of ceramics along those canal branches. And so this is something that I've been working with, um, trying to understand and how that's a very, very local way for these politics to, to be um, organized. And of course it makes a lot of sense because water is so key in this desert region. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the more recent work I've been um, involved in. So my, my dissertation work was in this heartland of the Moche, very, very typical Moche um, style ceramics. Recently, I started working in Pana Marca, um, which is to the uh, one of the southernmost um, Moche wakas, I would say. It's like we see other Moche influence, but this is like a, a Moche, there's Moche going on at this particular waka. And in 1950s, the incredible murals were discovered at this particular site, as you can see here. 
In 2010, my colleague Lisa Trevor, who's now at Columbia University, went down to document some of these um, murals that were discovered by that were discovered um, in the 50s. And what she ended up finding, though, was a whole bunch of new murals. And they're just really, really amazing. You can see some here. Here's some other examples of those murals. Um, and they're very much moche in terms of uh, the, he's holding the stirrup spout bottle. Over here, you can see there's a priestess with a goblet. So there's a, very much a moche theme going on with these. But we're tr you know, still trying to understand how this site, which is pretty far south of the, of the heartland, relates. So in 2010, and to the, last year, to 2019, um, I went down and I start, uh, we started a project with um, a couple other colleagues, Hugo Ikehara and Marco Pfeiffer and Lisa Trevor, to really understand like the larger landscape around this particular site and through time. And um, I'm mostly focused on the Moche period. And so I got to look at the corner of this large pyramid, this large waka, um, and only was there for two weeks. So really barely scratched the surface in this excavation. And what we found were tons of organic materials. So we were able to get really good radiocarbon dates. Um, and you'll see a ceramic here, which is not moche. It looks like, um, it looks like a cultural phenomenon to the South that um, is a little bit, uh, po possibly a little bit um, later, probably like around 900 to 1000 to 1100. That's right in there where our, our dates are showing. Um, so, so something different, something local is happening. Um, we also found, you can see all kinds of basketry and textiles and um, really, really neat, really good preservation there, including this piece of a textile fragment, which we think is a crown um, that I need to do a little bit more digging into. But again, this is kind of showing up at sites in a little bit further to the south, I would say, not as much in like the heartland of the Moche region. Um, and also dating to the late, very, very, very end of Moche or in a little bit later than that, again, what our rate of radiocarbon dates are. So we're kind of wondering and thinking that this last facade of this major pyramid at, at, um, at Pena Market is actually not Moche. Um, we are planning, but we're not sure, you know, we still, have, we still have some work to do. And I'll show you a little bit more. So here, that we're back on that waka, we're back here in this corner. And this is the actual corner of the waka. And you can see underneath of it, there's just dirt, and then below the dirt where it's fill, we should say, it's like artificially been brought in. And that's where all those ceramics were that were not moche, were in these layers. And down here, what we're looking at is at a floor. And there's a series of a, a few of these floors. And on this floor, we found fragments of um, painted plaster, which is probably mural painting that is related to moche levels that are below the level of that waka. So we have a lot of work to do. This was right at the end of our season in 2019. We were supposed to be back there this summer. Um, that's not going to happen. So we're hoping for 2021 to get back and really understand um, what's going on in this particular area and what that moche relationship is and what's happening right after moche and what really is going on. What are these political dynamics um, during the, 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 that time period of late moche and later? And what, something that's interesting, though, is when you really start to look at ceramics and obviously pots are not people, but we use pots a lot of times to try and understand um, things about people in certain ways. But the, so the moche ceramics in the Nepeña Valley, which is where Peña Marca is located, are very different. They're very crude compared to the, what we see in the um, Chicama Valley in the heartland, which is the other, you know, the other picture here. Very different. I mean, some it's, they're, they, you know, you can say they're moche, but something else is going on. Uh, again, some local component is really important. Um, so finally, I was supposed to two weeks ago be in Peru with my colleague Alicia Boswell and start a new project in the extreme northern regions of the Moche, um, Moche sphere in the upper Piura Valley. And this is a fascinating region. Um, there's um, Moche materials in this area, but it's really characterized by a style of ceramic called Vicus, which is really kind of um, different and strange. Um, and we see Vicus ceramics, we see these like moche ceramics, these like vicus knockoffs of moche ceramics, but also there's a lot of Ecuadorian um, ceramics in this area too. And the architecture has some kind of an Ecuadorian flair as well. And so um, 
The region has not received a, any really much at all um, investigation since the 90s. And so we're really excited to get in there with now having a different understanding of how we think Moche politics may have been a much more local phenomenon. How is this relating? How is this region relating? And what role is it playing? And so it was really excited, but that also was held off. And so hopefully we'll be back down there next year at some point to start some research there to start to piece this together. Um, these are some of the materials that are found in this really far northern region. Really great examples of metallurgy. The Moche were incredible metallurgists and really amazing gold. And I wanted to show this video because I was just completely struck by it. Um, so Alicia Boswell sent this to me, but it was from her colleague, um, Caitlin Early. She took it. It's at the Met Museum and you can see she's just, it's not playing really well, but she's just holding this and those little tiny, um, circles of gold are just flickering and I'll play it one more time they're just by just just holding it and you the, and you see these um all these burials they have these almost like tunics filled with these little gold and um little gold plates and um this is a nose piece and nose plates and you could just imagine what people would have looked like when they were dressed in these incredible um incredible regalia for whatever ceremonies they were performing Okay, so I just wanted to finally end here on um, this quote, which is uh, more more relevant and um, to our, you know, political more recent political times in the United States from Tip O'Neill uh, from Massachusetts, Speaker of the House in the 70s and 80s, and he said all politics is local and um, in recent years, there's kind of been a backlash to this in, in terms of American politics and how things have become so much more national. But I think right now in this time that we're living in the time of coronavirus, this statement is so true and how we're so re reliant on our governors and our mayors and city officials to really figure out what's going on. And I think that this is incredibly true for how we need to understand moche and how we need to understand you know the ancient civilizations that were that were more local in regard to whatever moche really what moche phenomenon really was and so this is an example of how ancient um archaeology ancient politics can kind of help us to inform modern politics and modern politics can help us inform what was going on in the ancient world so thanks <laughs> That was fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to our uh, audience on Facebook. You guys are asking some great questions. So Michelle, if you have time, I have three or four questions to ask you before we end our live stream today. Um, so one of the questions is, does the museum have any of these Moche collections? And can you give us a sense of that scale of the Wakis? Sure. So yes, we actually do have. Um, so I should I should say moche annex. There are so many. There's so many of them. They're in museums all across the world. Um, if even if you just go in in Lima, there's one museum called the Larco Museum, and there's like fifty thousand examples of moche ceramics or forty thousand examples. I mean, it's crazy. And we at DMNS have. Um, I would say, you know, probably like. 50 moche ceramic vessels. We also have quite a few vikus vessels, which is really interesting because that's um, you know that that northern that northern area. So that's been that that's going to be really interesting to look into because I'll be able to research those vessels as I get into the research there. So it's pretty um, yes, it's it's neat, and we have some neat ones as well. Um, maybe we can post them at some point <laughs> on our Facebook page. Um, and what was the second question again? And can you give us a sense of that scale? That one picture you showed of the visitors to the Waka was incredible. Those murals seem huge. Yeah, they're massive. And they are, so the, the if I'm recalling correctly, the Waka del Sol is 230 meters across. And so what's that? Two and a half football fields. Um, uh, and that that is a very, very large, large structure. The ones that I excavated, which is considered a like medium size or mid size center, those were 80 meet. The one was 80 meters across. And so, you know, just a little bit short of a football field. So very, very large structures and they range. They range so that that's some of the, like large, the largest example, 230. But we also find tiny ones that are maybe like 10 meters or so. Um, and they range in height too, up to like, you know, 60 meters, 
maybe not 60 meters, I think like 30 to 40 meters are some of the tallest ones. And then um, the ones I excavated were about 10 meters. And we do do everything in the metric system. <laughs> so I'm not converting because <laughs> I can't. Metal fields are good. That made sense to me. <laughs> um, and then one final question, and I don't know if you can speak to this because it sounds like you have some ongoing research, but do you think the wakas would have been reappropriated to later civilizations and that would account for that difference um, in textiles and ceramics that you've been finding? Definitely. The, we know these wakas are like, um, I like to think of them like onions. And so there's different layers and they built onto them through time. And so um, it is very, very, very common to find the later layers on top. And so in the earlier layers inside. And so it's very, very um, likely that, that, that this was just kind of re that reappropriated. We know that um, at Panya Marca, that site, so we have um, structure that is right next to the Waka that we have dated that goes back 20 to 2300 BC. So, I mean, people were living there. It was a very prominent place on the landscape. It was a very important um, site because of its um, physical just magnitude um, that it was important for a very, very long period of time. And so, um, yes, I would say yes. And everywhere we see this. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time for today, but thank you for those questions. Um, we have so enjoyed presenting our scientist division live to you guys this week, and we'll be back at it tomorrow or on Monday um, at noon. Um, and CMNS will have a live noon program every day of the week next week, right here on Facebook. So thank you to our audience. Thank you, Dr. Coons. This was fantastic. Um, and I know I learned so much. So we look forward to seeing you again. And thank you to everyone. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Like. <laughs>